I'm just going to turn back to um, our drone trivia that started today's webinar. And let me just go back to sharing the results again. <laughs> One of I can already see one of um one of the topics of interest is definitely regulations and as as several of our panelists has discussed as well. Uh, so the first question here we had is you need a pilot license to fly any drone in Canada. The correct answer is no. So the current regulation on drone licensing is um regulating drones from two hundred and fifty grams to 25 kilograms that's covered under the, the existing uh, basic or advanced pilot certificate or as known as the uh, Canadian drone license program. Anything above 25 kilograms go through a specialty flight operation certificate. So that means you still need to have your advanced pilot license before submitting for a specialty uh, certificate to fly anything above that category. And anything below 250 grams are regulated only by one rule. So it's outside of the pilot license requirement. So it's regulated by saying you still need to do it safely. Don't cause any, um, you know, apply common sense, don't cause, don't bring a, a threat to any public safety. Um, so the common drone there is the DJI Mini 2, which still has 4K capability with video, you know, still has all the smart features, uh, flies fairly well with the flight controls. Uh, and in the same, you know, DJI ecosystem, if you want to go ahead and, and buy additional drones from them. So it's the same control system. So that one is the go-to one for people who um, are not ready to get the license yet. It's, it's around 245 grams. So just below the 250. Um, and it's under $1,000. I believe it's around $700 with, um, with additional batteries and, uh, and as a combo package. So that's a really common one if anyone's interested to look into, you know, something to try out. Um, Next question. So actually, we're going to quickly go through all the trivia questions, and then we're going to turn our table for further discussion. So next one is Amazon is delivering your packages in North America. Um, it's not being delivered at the mass scale. There are selected testing facilities and, uh, um, you know, delivery in general, drone delivery in general is happening in actually all over the world, uh, each country differently, depending on, you know, their own regulations, terrain, uh, difficulties, technology level, etc. So later on, we'll dive deeper into drone delivery, uh, especially with the insight from Armin. Next one, there are over 60,000 drones registered in Canada. So that is correct. The exact number is about 61,000 from the, the most recent statistics from, uh, from Transport Canada last month. Um, and then over 60,000 licensed drone pilots. So this is the basic pilot license. Uh, the correct number, I believe, is around 66,000 at this point. Uh, the full advanced license is only just slightly over 6,000 right now. Um, and before the new rules came into force in 2019, the estimation was that there were over 200,000 people in Canada actually own drones at that point. Um, so we're now, the new regulations kicked in June 1st of 2019. So we're two and a half years since the pilot licensing system came into place. And we have over 60,000, you know, registered over 60,000 drone pilots licensed. So we're about one third of the estimate. And one of the common things we, we get asked a lot is, as you will think two and a half years with uh, the pilot licensing, everyone should know about the, the pilot license process right now. Um, but still there's the large general public who are not aware of the pilot licensing requirements and, and specifically what is required as the pilot license. And what does it actually allow you to do? Oh, that there's still a big gap in that public knowledge. And again, you know, as as Transport Canada always says, as well, it's it's everyone in the industry, it's all the general public and everyone with knowledge of the industry to start sharing more um, and start with more public education to get people to understand. Um, obviously, the end goal is not a strictly regulated industry, but you know, to deliver safety, the end goal is to make sure that everyone who's flying a drone is flying safely not causing any threats to people on the ground level and also safely integrate into the Canadian national airspace so we don't have any air-to-air -air accidents of crashing into any planes with the drone. So that's the overall goal of the regulation. Um, so now I'm also going to turn back to our uh, table for discussion. So let me just stop sharing the trivia right there. We're going to spend about 
10 minutes. So we have about 20 minutes left for round table discussion. Uh, we're going to divide that in half with 10 minutes discussion specifically on regulations, because that's a big topic in mind. And then the other 10 minutes, we're going to turn a little more to uh, general drone technologies. What, what is the hot topic of interest and what can we explore and do with drones? Um, so starting with the regulation topic, and let me also open the questions and the information I gathered from our panelists before starting the session. Uh, so Chris, I'm going to start with you first because I really liked uh, your input uh, from uh, from our pre-webinar survey. So you, you had some questions asking about from regulation perspective. Um, maybe I'll turn it to you to get the, to get the exact question. Uh, um, you had some concerns and questions specifically related to drone regulations. Well, it's just with the questions about drone regulations. I guess my my question, and this is perhaps a question to the panel, is is why is it we feel, um, let me take a step back, you mentioned something very important, uh, the notion of drone safety, and I think Transport Canada is, is definitely has some concerns, rightly so, about uh, drone safety. My question was more, uh, maybe for the panel, why do we feel that drones are so heavily regulated compared to other things? Uh, the example I've often used, and the question in my mind, and may come across as a bit naive for some of the panelists, but you have something like Google Street View and you have the Google Street car driving up and down the street, um, taking pictures of everyone's house in a residential area. That's just fine. But when somebody from a municipality wants to go and fly a drone with a camera in it uh, to collect the realignment of a, uh, an intersection that's just been paved, there are all these hoops and restrictions on the size and they can't do this and they can't do that. And I guess my question is, there's gotta be something more than just the fact that one's on the ground and one's on the air. I just wonder why we, beyond the safety, why is it we feel that there's such strict regulations? Um, so I'll, I'll kick off a little bit and then I'll turn to uh, um, our other panelists. Maybe maybe they have their insight as well. Um, so first of all, because uh, drones fall under Transport Canada and specifically Transport, Transport Canada does have their RPAS uh, division, but specifically this is the aviation because Transport Canada covers the air, uh, ground and water here in Canada and it's a federal body, right? So we fall under the aviation part of Transport Canada. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, as far as general aviation goes, everything is a big deal. Uh, everything takes, you know, a long time to assess the risks, assess the potential safety hazards to, you know, before it becomes a, a piece of regulation. And I remember one of the things Transport Canada always likes to stress on is every, almost every piece of rule in, in cars, which is the Canadian Aviation Regulations, is written in blood because an accident had happened in the past and, and brought up that issue. Um, so I'll share with my experience. The, the first question I got from Transport Canada, this is about 10 years ago when I submitted my first SFOC application. So back then drones were, were managed under special flight operation certificate. And coming from a film production, you know, I'm used to working with explosions, used to working with million dollar actors where all the safety things you have to consider way ahead of time. So I thought I wrote the operations procedure, you know, to the T that they won't be able to get back to me with any questions. Um, but then TC came back to me and the inspector said, okay, so you've got everything covered. Uh, what happens if the drone crashes to the ground? Now, what happens if the drone doesn't crash and it flies straight up into the air? So that was actually the one thing I didn't consider. <laughs> Because especially back then, we're flying, you know, a 23 kilogram drone with really high capacity uh, lithium polymer batteries that, that can self-inflame or inflame up on impact um, and generate really high heat. So basically, the concern was what happens instead of crashing down, you know, this machine flies up and, uh, and crashes with a small airplane or a helicopter. And the battery, you know, gets into the engine or causes an aircraft fire and essentially you may... The, the, the worry was you may bring down an actual airplane with people on there. 
So at that point, it's no longer crashing to the ground and, and you try to clear the ground to make sure no one gets hurt. <laughs> um, so that was the first time I realized, oh, okay, there are actually other things you need to, you need to consider about the airspace. So when we deal with uh, the regulation and licensing, you know, the first time we do operations training, we always ask the students is if your drone has a flyaway, if it's no longer in the control of your controller, uh, what do you do or who do you call? So they need to have the airspace knowledge, at least to know, okay, there's the emergency airspace um, ATC contact or the what we call the flight information uh, center as well. So it doesn't matter who it is, you need to know that there is an emergency number to call. Give them your last known location, your speed, your estimated direction, and that way they can, they can uh, determine who are the affected aircraft in this area of a drone flyaway, and they can evacuate those airplanes. Uh, so basically to answer Chris's question is, there is the bigger concern, anything related to general aviation safety, anything with a potential threat to bring down an airplane, it's always a big deal. I mean, that's not to say on the ground level, the lives are any less important, but it's just the nature of, of general aviation. Um, and then with that note, I also turn back to, to our um, rest of the panelists, especially, you know, I really like to get some insight from, from Armin because with drone delivery, it's definitely a type of operation uh, that requires a lot more consideration, not just on the general aviation safety, but also communications is how you make sure that the drone is actually delivering to the right location. Um, and my specific question is, you know, say if you're delivering to rural areas, there, there are probably um, animals, right, as simple as people's pets, dogs, or, or other wild animals running around. Um, so how do you manage that? So when the drone is landing, how do you make sure that nothing is going to interfere or get in the way? Yifei, thank you very much for the question. And Chris, I uh, appreciate the question as well. I think there was maybe some folks in the audience asking about regulations. And, and this is the big question, right? It's just uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new technology, it's a new industry, really we're, you know, we're kind of developing it as we go along because, you know, it, 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 you know a couple of years ago, you know, yes, we were flying drones, but now that it's becoming a bit more commercial, Transport Canada is starting to see, okay, well, you know, we need to put some regulations around it or else anybody, you know, across your street can operate a drone go in your backyard, take photos. So it becomes a bit kind of, you know, complicated, uh, especially on the commercial side. So there's a lot of concerns by the public, but, you know, the intent is actually good. It's just, we need to make sure that there are certain restrictions and um, protections in terms of reducing risk. And that's Transport Canada's mindset is how do we reduce the risk, whether it's ground risk or air risk. So um, in terms of regulations, I mean, look, right now, I mean, I, anybody around the world, you know, flying a drone over people is, you know, something that's unfortunately, and I don't want to speak to, on behalf of my colleague at Drone Delivery Canada, Steve, who's the specialist. So I'm not necessarily the, the specialist when it comes to regulations, but flying over people is definitely right now something that is not allowed, right? Because they, they want to be able to make sure that people walking on the street are safe and there's nothing that's going to fall in their head from the sky. So, you know, there are certain uh, things that we are able to do, but, you know, obviously with new technology evolving, you know, so we recently announced the Canary, the Canary will have a parachute on it, integrated. So if in case something happens, that parachute will slow the kinetic energy of the, that drone falling down. So that helps mitigate some of these uh, aspects. Um, so as technology evolves, it'll catch up to the regulations. And I think that's the message that we continue uh, uh, portraying is we need to uh, increase and advance that technology to be able to serve at a broader, broader range of community. Um, but in terms of animals, you know, right now, the way we kind of address it is, um, you know, we have visual observers on the ground and we have safety pilots. So if you have a route, you have somebody looking at the sky uh, and you have somebody looking at the ground. So these are the, I would say the, uh, you know, the resources that help us to mitigate and reduce the risk of, you know, potentially, uh, you know, impacting wildlife. And eventually what's gonna happen is technology is gonna catch up. We're gonna have, um, you know, new technology like the detect and avoid system, a DAA, that's gonna be on board. 
And that's not only going to help us with anything that's flying around in terms of uh, wildlife, but also airplanes. So if you think about rural environments, when a drone is operating, you might have somebody that's operating a small airplane like a crop duster, and it doesn't necessarily show up on anybody's radar because they might not have necessarily the, the, the avionic systems that anybody can capture them. So this is where a DAA technology will help us uh, reduce the risk in allowing us to operate in, um, I would say, in, in higher risk environments. I hope that answers your question, uh, Chris, Yifei. Mm -hmm. Definitely answered mine. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I, 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 do, I do definitely appreciate the, um, uh, the notion of safety. It, it, it is something that sure is, is a little bit of a different consideration than something that's <clears throat> already in contact with the ground. It's not going to fall out of the sky onto the ground. Um, I just, but you actually, um, Armin, you, 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 you raised an interesting point about the, the privacy and flying into the backyard, which is another one that I've all I've often um, sort of thought was was very interesting that that notion of privacy, and how I think one of the things that as a drone industry I think we need to do a better job of um, is selling the value of what we do because I think you know you bring up drones at the the, the classic cocktail party uh, scenario uh, you start talking about people about drones and they think they do two things they invade privacy or they invade countries and that's about it. Um, whereas the, we know that there's so many more uh, values uh, and, and benefits of drone technology. So, so I think one, people, yeah. sorry. Yeah, and, I, and I mentioned, you know, the house because, you know, oddly enough, I, I had a, some drone follow my backyard a couple of days ago. So, you know, it's, it's just like, you know, you question, you're like, okay, well, you know, what, what was the purpose? What were they doing? And, and again, it's just, you know, somebody off the street that just, you know, uh, you know, it could be, uh, you know, anybody that buys it commercially off the shelf drone, they don't necessarily have, you know, the, the knowledge of operating it. They just want to do it because it's fun and it's exciting. People want to take selfies and, you know, but, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, if that thing falls and you could injure somebody. So this is where Transport Canada is looking at mitigating those risks mm -hmm. and making sure that, you know, if, you know, for example, we're walking downtown Toronto uh, and, you know, somebody's operating a drone, it's not going to fall on our heads. Um, and also just going back to, you know, about flying over uh, backyards, there was, I've, I've heard actually lots of different business cases being presented by, you know, people interested in drone technologies. And one of them said, oh, I'm going to go to different munis municipalities and present a service to them where I can actually go and, and, and check for any infringements on city bylaws. So if I just take off with the drone on the street, I can see if someone's cutting their grass, if they have in, any illegal, uh, you know, build in their yard. Um, and they, they hit a pretty hard, you know, um, legal, <laughs> legal, legal feedback from uh, municipalities is they were concerned because if you if you're not just regular, if you're not doing any regular check inspection, that you're driving down the street and, and people put up fences that you can't see what's behind it. That's different than if you deliberately go flying, you know, down the street and check for any infringement on, on bylaws, even just to have that uh, justified in court and maybe actually most of them will be thrown out from court because the, the evidence is not captured uh, legally or, you know, meeting the regulation or meeting the purpose of, uh, of setting up that bylaw. Uh, so lots of things you could do with technologies, but definitely you have to be careful with, with how you do it. Um, and the one thing I always like to say is, are you causing harm to somebody else? For, from your action, right? If you're causing harm to somebody else or, you know, affecting how they're enjoying their private property, then definitely that's the wrong thing to do. Um, so on that note, I'll also quickly turn back to you, to Amanda and, uh, and Trevor. Uh, we'll start with uh, Amanda, especially from Seneca, you know, having lots of relationship with Transport Canada uh, in the past. What's, what are your thoughts on drone regulations? Absolutely, thank you. And thank you everyone. I'm learning a lot, I'm taking lots of notes. Um, so there's something that with our MAN program is called airmanship, and it's very tightly tied to the Transport Canada regulations, which, you know, as Ife said, in blood, um, they're not there for, uh, you know, decoration. They're there because something has happened. We work within a very strict 
um, hazard registry to reduce that risk. Um, we have a safety management system for the manned flying. And looking at this new wheelhouse, we've really been working with our safety program and saying, what is this going to look like in the future for unmanned? How are we going to collect data for our safety management system to ensure that we have a registry that looks at hazards for unmanned? Um, in the program so far, we actually have two dedicated courses, one called Human Factors and one called Safety Management Systems that actually just look at the CARS, the Canadian um, Aviation Regulations specifically. We have case studies from both um, Part 107 FAA, which is the American, and then also the um, Transport Canada for the students to actually take a look at the man and say, great, we have this in blood doctrination, doctrination of regulatory systems. What does that mean for unmanned systems? So we really want the graduate to untangle these privacy issues, these safety issues, security issues for the unmanned world because we have such a strict Transport Canada manned world already. Um, so they're really going to be the front runners of taking a look at what currently exists and what do we have to continue to look at. The one thing I'll also mention is multi-crew cooperation. So Armin was saying that you have folks on the ground, you have folks that are looking at the data and how is that communication happening in a safe manner? So there's an array of different topics within this program that will create a ready uh, set solution-based graduate for the industry. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and also turning over to Trevor, from research perspective, what have you seen from regulations? I probably don't know the regulations as uh, people here who have to work on their day-to-day -day jobs, but I would agree with, um, as was mentioned earlier, I think it's very natural that is it um, still, uh, I guess, a maturing technology. It's still or, or, um, emerging or maturing technology. It's still seen with a lot of apprehension by policymakers. Um, I'd also say the risk of um, bad actors, uh, I suppose. And I think, unfortunately, commercial drone usage has um, probably been, um, is subject to a high level of rigor, probably due to the um, actions of individuals and kind of um, uh, on personal usage, I think kind of uh, fairly or unfairly, I think it's been kind of tainted by um, maybe like a negative uh, halo effect from um, irresponsible individuals. And and so I think it's, um, you have very vivid examples of disruption, whether it's um, drones interfering with like wildfire fighting, I know in Western Canada or um, airports, the thought that one or more anonymous individuals could take down an airplane by accident or, or just disrupt the traffic in general, like was in the UK uh, a year or two ago. I think these examples are very vivid to uh, policymakers and, and leads to a lot of um, uh, apprehension in the area. And I think, I mean, maybe this is more philosophical or, or ethically. I think people just um, are a little bit apprehensive about the fact that it's unmanned and, and there's uh, uh, perhaps kind of these sort of risks of, of this anonymity of kind of like the machines are out there as opposed to like, for example, yeah, a, a Google uh, street car being driven around that someone can be kind of held a little bit more accountable. There's, there's someone there is quite tied to the individual. You say, I, I could arrest this person or I know who it is. The fact that it is not a person or not an organization directly kind of tied to that you can see, I think, um, raises people's levels of uh, concern. Trevor, you actually raised that a good question. One of the challenges law enforcement had mentioned is, um, is if even if you see someone flying a drone, and we we say we see someone flying a drone, but from prosecution perspective, is how do you prove that that controller the person has is actually controlling that drone out there? Right, you still need to convince the the judge and everybody else if that ever goes into the the, um, the court of law. So that was actually an interesting debate with uh, with the public with the law enforcement officers as well. Um, and one of the things I'll mention just to wrap up our regulation discussion is is enforcement. So we haven't really touched enforcement because as strict as regulations can be without you know actual effective enforcement, it doesn't really mean anything. And enforcement is not really in place or uh, to the degree all the professional operators would like to see. So as Trevor mentioned, you know, there are, there are probably individuals doing the wrong acts that's hurting the industry and professional operators who, who spent the time <clears throat> and effort uh, 
to do things right. We don't want to be hurt or damaged because you know that couple of individuals doing things wrong. Um, so we all like to see enforcement coming up more. And it's only with the proper enforcement then we'll see the regulations making sense. We'll see less and less people who just buy a drone and go out, you know, to do anything they like to or they choose to.